Welcome to Have History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and in today's episode, I want to read Stonewall Jackson's report of the Battle of Fredericksburg. Jackson remains a stoic figure in many of our eyes, and this report gets at the heart of what Jackson as a military commander valued, but it also allows us to peer into the mind of this tactician. About 10 o'clock as the fog disappeared, the lines of the enemy arranged in our order of battle were distinctly visible in the plain between us and the river, covering my front and extending far to the left toward Fredericksburg. The force in front of me I supposed to number about 55,000. Pelham, with part of the Stuart's horse artillery, was soon engaged with the artillery of the enemy, and a brisk and animated contest was kept up for about an hour. Soon after Pelham, in obedience to orders, had withdrawn from his position on the Port Royal Road, the enemy directed his artillery on the heights, held by Lieutenant Colonel Walker and upon the wood generally occupied by our troops, evidently with a view of causing us to disclose whatever troops or artillery were there. Not eliciting any response, the enemy was seemingly satisfied that he would experience but little resistance to an effort to obtain possession of this hill. Accordingly, about 11 o'clock, he advanced to my flank parallel to the Port Royal Road, nearly to the road running from thence to Hamilton's Crossing. Now unimpeded in his march, as Pelham was withdrawn, facing to the front, he advanced in line of battle across the plain, straight upon the position and occupied by Walker. His batteries reserved their fire until the enemy's lines came within less than 800 yards, when the 14 guns opened, pouring such a storm of shot and shell into his ranks as to cause him to first to halt, then to waver, and at last seek shelter by flight. About one o'clock, the main attack was made by heavy and rapid discharges of artillery. Under the protection of this warm and well-directed fire, his infantry and heavy force advanced, seeking the partial protection of a piece of wood extending beyond the railroad. The batteries on the right played on their flanks with destructive effect. The advancing force was visibly staggered by a rapid and well-directed artillery, but soon recovered from the shock. The federal troops, consisting of the main body of Franklin's Grand Division, supported by a portion of Hooker's Grand Division, continued to press forward advancing within point-blank range of our infantry, and thus exposed to the murderous fire of musketry and artillery, the struggle became fierce and sanguinary. They continued, however, still to press forward, and before General A.P. Hill closed the interval, which he had left between Archer and Lane, it was penetrated, and the enemy, pressing forward in overwhelming numbers through that interval, turned Lane's right and Archer's left. Thus attacked in front and rear the 14th Tennessee and 19th Georgia of Archer's Brigade, and the entire brigade of Lane fell back, but not until after a brave and obstinate resistance, notwithstanding the perilous situation in which Archer's brigade was placed, his right, changing front, continued to struggle with undaunted firmness, materially checking the advance of the enemy until reinforcements came to its support. The brigade of General Thomas, posted as before stated, moved gallantly forward and joined the 7th and part of the 18th North Carolina of Lane's brigade gallantly drove back the federal column which had broken through Lane's line. In the meantime, a large force of the enemy penetrated the wood and rear of the position occupied by the brigades of Lane and Archer, and came in contact with Gregg's brigade. Taken by surprise, Orr's rifles were thrown into confusion. It was in the act of rallying this regiment that Brigadier General Maxie Gregg fell in front of the rifles, mortally wounded. General Gregg was a brave and accomplished officer, full of heroic sentiment and chivalrous honor. He had rendered valuable service in his struggle for our freedom, and the country has much reason to deplore the loss sustained by his premature death. Colonel Hamilton, upon whom the command of that brigade now devolved, hastened to meet the emergencies of his position, and with the four remaining regiments and one company of the Orr Rifles, gave the enemy a warm reception. The enemy was not long permitted to hold the advantage which he had thus gained. The second line came promptly to the support of the first, Lawton's brigade, commanded by Colonel Adkins, subsequently by Colonel Evans, Trimble's brigade, commanded by R.F. Hoke, and Early's brigade, commanded by Colonel Walker, all under the command of Brigadier General Early, and the 47th and 22nd Virginia regiments of Colonel Brockenbrough's command were already rushing with impetuous valor to the support of the first line. In Taliaferro's command, his right regiment, the 2nd Virginia of Paxton's brigade, became engaged with part of the enemy, which after a slight resistance retreated. The combat in the wood was brief and decisive. The farther advance of the enemy was checked, 
He was driven with great slaughter from the wood to the railroad. The two regiments of Brock and Braw's command, Archer and the 1st Tennessee and 5th Alabama Battalion, and the three brigades commanded by Colonels Hoke, Walker, and Atkinson, pursuing the retreating Federals to the railroad where they made a brief stand when Hoke and Atkinson charged upon them, destroying many in the charge and taking a large number of prisoners. Nor did they stop there, but impelled by an ardor which reflects the highest credit on their courage and patriotism. This comparatively small force pressed the discomfited foe in hot pursuit until they appeared so far within range of his artillery and the fire of a large force of his infantry as to make further pursuit an act of rashness. In this gallant charge, Atkinson was severely wounded and fell into the hands of the enemy. Colonel E.P. Lawton, Assistant Adjutant General of the Brigade, though injured through the advance by the fall of his horse, continued to press forward on foot, heroically encouraging the brigade until he fell mortally wounded. On the extreme left, the day did not pass without incident of worthy notice. Early in the day, the enemy opened upon the left with 16 guns, afterward increased to 24. The officers in command obeyed their orders and, reserving their fire, the enemy advanced his skirmishers in heavy line upon the points occupied by the commands of Captains Davidson and Brockenbrough. They were soon driven off by canister, but the position of these batteries being thus disclosed to the enemy, a heavy artillery fire was directed upon them, which was replied to with animation and spirit. The ammunition of Captain Raines's battery proving defective, it was withdrawn and Captain Latimer, acting chief of artillery of Ewell's division, was ordered to take a position still further to the front and left. These last pieces were admirably served, and though suffering severely from skirmishers and sharpshooters drove them back, and by the accuracy and rapidity of their fire inflicted a severe loss upon the enemy. As the Federal infantry pressed forward upon our front, it was deemed advisable to withdraw the batteries of Captain Brock and Braun placed in advance of the railroad before the enemy should seize the point of the woods to the right and rear, which they short time afterwards penetrated the withdrawal of the batteries being covered by Lieutenant Colonel Hill of the 7th North Carolina. Repulsed on the right, left, and center, the enemy soon afterward reformed his lines and gave some indication of a purpose to renew the attack. I waited some time to receive it, but he making no forward movement, I determined, if prudent, to do so myself. The artillery of the enemy was so judiciously posted as to make an advance of our troops across the plain very hazardous. Yet it was so promising of good results, if successfully executed, as to induce me to make preparations for the attempt. In order to guard against disaster, the infantry was to be preceded by artillery and the movement postponed until late in the evening, so that if compelled to retire, it would be under the cover of night. Owing to unexpected delays, the movement could not have be gotten ready until late in the evening. The first gun had hardly moved forward from the wood a hundred yards when the enemy's artillery reopened, and so completely swept our front as to satisfy me that the proposed movement should be abandoned. I hope you enjoyed the account of Stonewall Jackson about the Battle of Fredericksburg. By reading these personal accounts and these official reports, I think we understand Jackson a little bit better, especially in the way that we perceive him as a tactician. If y'all would like to support the channel, you can support it through Patreon. I also have a Teespring store with some awesome shirt designs. And the Facebook and Twitter page links are all in the description below. And I'll see you next week.